Okay, welcome to class, everybody. Happy Monday. All right, let's, uh, so we've wrapped up chapter five. The only thing that I'll say just very briefly is we talked about the different microscopy methods. Um, the one last thing that might be useful to say is that when it comes to um, microscopy techniques, <clears throat> oftentimes the most important parameter that you want to capture is the grain size, right? So if you have like this like naive cartoon version, you can kind of see the grains clearly, but how do you quantify the grain size, right? If we look at... Um, If you look at a microstructure, it might look something like this, right? So how do you report the grain size? Any thoughts? How would you go about reporting the grain size of this microstructure? Let me turn to a neighbor. What would you do if you wanted to quantify this microstructure? Any thoughts? What do we think? Because clearly, like, there's some bigger grains and some smaller grains, right? So what do we do to quantify this microstructure? Any ideas? You could take an average. Now, when you say take an average, what are you actually doing then? That means that you're literally measuring each one of these. How do you do that? And you've got a scale bar, which is helpful. But what are you doing? You could take a ruler... You could say, when I measure this with a ruler, it's 12 inches. When I measure this, it's 8 inches. So this is 8 divided by 12 of 100 microns. That's one way to do it, right? So that works. What other things matter about this, right? Clearly, like, the grain size, but some of these things are what we call non-equiaxed. Remember what if we briefly said this. An equiaxed grain is something like maybe this one. It's nice and round. It doesn't have like a, a dominant axis, which is longer than the others. Whereas these other ones are anisotropic grains or anisotropic grain growth, right? Where it's grown in one crystal direction more than the other. So quantifying anisotropy and grain size are important things. They go beyond the scope of this class. So all I'm going to say is that there's a nice tool for calculating grain size, and it's called the line intercept method. How it works, and I'll just be very brief here, is you draw a bunch of random lines on this, right? Literally draw a bunch of lines stretched across it, and you count intersections. You count every time that it crosses one of these grain boundaries, and there's a formula that goes from the number of those intersections, the length of the line that you drew, the length of the scale bar that will spit out an average grain size. That's an ASTM standard. What is an ASTM standard leads us directly to our new chapter. right? So if you want to see a, um, a video where I've done this for you, we've shown you the line intercept method. Um, in this video, we actually quantify grain size for this funky structure here. Okay, So let's dive into this chapter now, which is uh, chapter 7. And let me start with our learning objectives. In this chapter, it's all about mechanical properties. So we're going to learn the basics of stress and strain. We're going to introduce the difference between true stress and strain versus engineering stress and strain. We'll use Hooke's Law to calculate strain that occurs for a given stress. We're going to identify things like yield stress, proportional limit, ultimate tensile stress, toughness, resilience. All these terms, we're going to define what they mean and show how you calculate them from mechanical property measurements. Uh, we'll describe Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, um, and that's probably as far as we'll get today. One thing that TA's uh, pointed out is there's a possible ambiguity here. In the, in the homework, we talked about units and using E correctly. So this one E to the, fi to the five, that's capital E. This sometimes gets rewritten as one lowercase e to the 5. These are technically both okay. What's not okay is raising this 5 to an exponent. Because if it's raised to an exponent, then you think that this is e the natural number, right? Like exp to the 5. And so that's the difference. So if you write these on the same line, these two are basically okay. But this would not be okay. Right? Any questions on that? Okay. So we've talked about materials. We've talked about the types of imperfections in materials at least basics of it, we're now ready to start talking about how these imperfections in materials change their properties. 
And we're going to start with mechanical properties. What's the role of these defects or pure materials when it comes to mechanical properties? And many people have seen the basics of mechanics before, so bear with me today as we cover some of the, the, the background that other students might not have seen yet. Um, I think it's pretty obvious why mechanical properties matter to engineers. Forces are being applied to materials all the time, right? This can cause fracture and failure, which we've talked about. There's accidents. There's safety factors you have to worry about when you're designing. Um, things will deform. Sometimes they're supposed to deform under a load. Other times it's just an unfortunate side effect of the, of the loading conditions that you get deformation. So we need to understand how these things work in materials. Okay? Um, so that said, we'll be doing, you will all probably be doing testing at some point in your career. And there's a big question on how do you test things that everyone else can test it the same way and get the same results as you. This is actually a big problem, is non-uniform testing and therefore non-uniform reporting of data. You can have a group out of Utah here that reports, say, yield strength of a commercial alloy, but we measure it in a different way than a group in Colorado or Florida or wherever else. And so now you've got these different data sets, and you, want, you have to wonder, well, which one's the right one for my application? To fix that problem, there's something called the ASTM standards. Anybody heard... Has anybody not heard of these before? How common is this, ASTM standards? Sounds like most people have heard. I'm seeing a few hands that haven't. ASTM <clears throat> is right here. It's ASTM.org. It's a nonprofit. This pulls up. It's a nonprofit that talks about testing and standard uh, protocols and methodologies. That is the slowest it's ever been, right? So ASTM International, they develop these protocols for testing in ways that everybody can do it the exact same way and get the same results. So it's very detailed. It'll give you things like the temperature of the room, the humidity of the room. If that matters, they'll, they'll say, make sure that when you do your testing, you're between this and this range. It'll tell you the rates of the mechanical loading to be applied, the types of fixtures, when you can rule it as an objective measurement versus one that you can throw out. All of these are captured in the ASTM standards. The downside is that even though it's a nonprofit, you have to pay for these things, which sucks. But the good side is that at the University of Utah, we have all of them for free. They're in the library, right? So you can get a copy of these ASTM standards. Um, if you work for a company, it's very likely that your boss, he or she, will say, we need to test such and such a property, maybe fracture toughness, and you need to use ASTM, and they'll give you like five or six letters. That's referring to a specific code that you can look up, right? You can search for them right here. You could punch in, right, whatever your code is. Or just type in a topic like fracture toughness, and up is going to pop the different ASTMs associated with fracture toughness. And there's a large number. In practice, not all of them get used, but there's lots out there to choose from. This is going like very slow today, but yeah. This would be one way to test fracture toughness, okay? So that's ASTM standards. Um, okay, so let's dive right into some of the basics of mechanical properties. Um, there's different types of loads, and we've talked about this briefly in this class. If this table is the object that's going to receive the load, I could load it in different ways. I could just push straight down on it, right? I could grab that end and this end, and I could stretch it. In both of those cases, what I'm doing is I'm applying a load perpendicular to the surface, right? This is the surface I'm, that is going to be loaded. I'm pushing straight down, or I'm pulling straight up on it, maybe. That's a very different load than if I'm going to be pushing with some degree that's parallel to the surface, right? If I'm pushing it like this and it's sliding, some force is going down, and the angle and the coefficient of friction, all this tells me how much of that force is going down, but some of it is actually shearing the table, right? So there's shear forces, right? And therefore, accordingly, shear stresses, and there's normal forces and normal stresses, right? So the first two cases, tensile and compressive, these are both with the load perpendicular to the face, right? We know that stress, we've talked about this, stress is equal to the force divided by the area. So this allows us to normalize things. A great big bridge can have the same what's called a yield stress, stress the point at which it starts to yield to deform, as a very small material the same bridge is made out of, but they can have very different forces that cause that yielding because they have different cross-sectional areas, right? So stress allows us to normalize for area, right? Now these two, these are both shear stresses, these scenarios. You're applying the force parallel to the face, right? Here's your face, some forces like that. And the types of deformation are very different. In the top two, you're going to elongate it or you're going to squish it with the accompanying making it skinnier or making it a little bit fatter when we do that. But that's not the case here with the shear force. Here you're going to deform it like this. It's going to shift on an angle, right? So you're going to see this angle, uh, what's called theta here. 
right? That's going to be the type of deformation rather than an elongation or a compression, okay? And torsion is just a special type of shear where it's rotating about a, a principal axis, okay? So when they do these tests, tension tests are almost always done uh, under, a, under, a, under a sample where you're forcing it to break in a certain spot. Now, the reason they do this is because when you put this in a fixture, it's typically a clamp. If it's a polymer material, you're just going to clamp right onto it, right? And you'll notice that these are what are called a dog bone shape, how it sort of bends in and then it bends out again. The reason they do that is because if you clamp onto it, you're going to introduce defects right where you clamped onto it. And you don't want it to fail where you clamped onto it because then you're not testing an inherent property of the material. You're testing your clamping method, right? So instead, they make it narrower in the center by the cross-sectional area going down, right? If cross-sectional area goes down, we know from our stress formula, stress equals F over A. If A goes down, that the stress locally goes up in this middle region of the sample. Therefore, it, it sees a higher stress than the other regions, and it's more likely to fail in the middle, which rules out things like, oh, there's a flaw when you clamped it, right? Now, not all materials can be clamped. I imagine taking a pair of like vice grips on a dinner plate, clamping it, and then like pulling that apart. It's definitely going to break at the wherever you clamped it, no matter how much of the dog bone necking down there is, right? So this doesn't work for all materials. It works great for polymers. It can work for some metals. Other metals, you screw them in. See the threaded feature on the right? It's accomplishing the same end result, but you don't have to clamp onto it in that case. You're relying on the threads to grab it without actually a compressive stress grabbing it, okay? In either case, <clears throat> under tensile loading, you're going to pull on this thing and it's going to fracture eventually. It might deform first. If it's a polymer or metal, it's likely going to deform. If it's a ceramic, you probably won't see any deformation. It's just going to fracture, right? So we have stress is force over area. And now we need to talk about how much deformation occurs. Deformation, we're going to call this strain. It has the Greek symbol epsilon. Strain is equal to, often, you'll often see written delta L over L. A more exact way of writing that would be L initial, or sorry, L, that's not initial, that's L instantaneous, LI, minus L initial, that's L0, <clears throat> divided by L0. So L final minus L initial divided by L final. That's your strain, okay? As I mentioned, these things, when you strain them, if you started out with a uh, sample that looked like this, and after you strained it, you notice that it looks like this, really exaggerated. It's not just that it got longer. L final, or L i, we could call it if this is L zero. L i got longer, but the cross-sectional area also decreased. Why does that happen? Let me turn to a neighbor. Why, why does it decrease? Okay, what do we think? Let me ask Carter. Carter, what's going on here? Why on earth did this thing seem to shrink? And it does shrink. Yeah. You started out with some finite number of atoms, and if you're stretching them a little bit, if we're increasing them that way, some of that accommodation is going to come from them decreasing in the other directions, right? There's a finite amount of mass. Um, this has to do with something called the Poisson's ratio, which we'll get to in a moment. And it goes the other way as well. If you squeeze something, it's going to bulge out the sides a little bit. Now, here's the key thing, and this is kind of interesting. It's not the same for all materials. This is kind of surprising. You'd think like, okay, if you squeeze on something, they're all going to sort of bulge out at the same ratio. But that's not the case. Different materials will do so at different amounts. So there's a material that won't bulge out at all. Anybody know what this is from practical experience? Have you ever squeezed something and noticed that it doesn't expand? I can think of a couple examples. And on the other hand, there's others where you squeeze it and they expand a lot. Anybody have a feel for what these end members are? In the reading, it talked about it a little bit. Yeah, Miranda? Yeah, so cork or styrofoam, things like that that have lots of pores in them, they sort of cheat because they have lots of built-in air pockets. So when you squeeze on them, there's room for the material to collapse in on itself. So cork has what's called a Poisson's ratio of zero, or very close to zero. It almost doesn't expand outward when you crush it. Same with things like styrofoam, very little uh, expansion radially. Um, other things are like rubber. Maybe you've like taken like a rubber eraser. If you squeeze that, you can really see it bulge outward, much more than a, a polymer of other types or, or a metal. Okay? So we'll, we'll come back to that. So there's something called engineering stress and engineering strain. 
engineering stress and engineering strain um, are done with the initial cross-sectional area, right? So let's say you had a cross-sectional area of one or two, three inches squared, and as you're deforming it, this thing is going to shrink. But if you keep on calculating the force over area using the initial cross-sectional area, we call that engineering strain, right? So it's not correct. It's just easier because oftentimes when you're doing these measurements, measuring the instantaneous cross-sectional area can be tricky to do. If you can measure that, you get what's called the true strain, right? So if you're <clears throat> dividing by the, the values in real time, the instantaneous, say, length or instantaneous cross-sectional area, that will give you true stress, but otherwise you have engineering stress and engineering strain. The units are, um, depending on what you're measuring, if you're measuring stress, that's going to be a force over an area, so that's a newton per meter squared, right? And by definition, one megapascal is equal to one million newtons per meter squared. So this is an important relationship to know. A newton per meter squared is a pascal, and a million of those is a megapascal, and that's a very common unit because that happens to be about the right stress where things often happen in materials. Is about on the order of mass megapascals. Strain is interesting in that it doesn't have units, right? Delta L over L, a length minus a length is still a length. Divided by a length means that you don't have any units. So because of that, strain will often be reported as a percent or as a parts per million, which just means that you take the number and divide it by 1e to the 6th, right? That's strain. All right, compressive stress are very similar, except that now we define the force as being negative. If it's a compressive force, by definition, we call that a negative force, whereas a tension... Something that's pulling it apart, we call that a positive force. Otherwise, you treat them the same. Okay? Shear stress um, is the same, except that now instead of measuring strain as a delta L over L, we said that shear stress doesn't necessarily change the length, right? Here's our shear stress scenario. It's not like this thing got longer. It's that it got shifted. And that shift, this angle theta, is what dictates the shear strain. So shear strain, gamma, is given by the tangent of that angle. Okay? Gamma is our shear strain, and it's given by the tangent of the angle that's produced, okay? We're not going to talk about torsion in this class. Okay, just because you apply a load to a material, and let's say you, you're putting it normal to the face, so you think, aha, this is great, there's no shear present, <clears throat> right? In this picture of this sort of cylinder, the load that's being applied is perfectly normal to the top and bottom faces. That doesn't mean that we can't imagine a plane in this material where there is a shear force, right? Imagine this, this, art, this imaginary plane that they drew in that material, right? In that plane, the force is now no longer perpendicular to that face. And since it's not perpendicular, it's going to have some regular stress and some shear stress components. So we can calculate what those components are just by these expressions here. For a given stress, right, this is the applied stress, which was perpendicular to a face, Right? That's that. At some angle within your material, you can calculate what the, the normalized stress would be and the normalized stre uh, strain would be on that plane using those expressions. Okay? That becomes really important next chapter when it comes to something called slip or movement of atoms and single crystals. So we're going to come back to that. All right. For now, let's keep it simple with mechanical properties. And let's ask the question, if I strain something... <clears throat> How much stress was necessary to create that strain? Or another way, if I'm going to apply a force over an area, so there's a stress being applied, how much deformation can I expect to see? At its very simplest, we have something called Hooke's Law, right? Hooke's Law, you, you would have seen it in physics at one point when they talked about a spring, for example. If you had a spring and you have a mass on a spring, when you apply that mass, it's going to elongate by some distance x. And that distance x is related to what's called a spring constant k, which you would have seen at some point. This is the exact same thing. In materials, we have the exact same approach. Atoms and the bonds between atoms can actually be treated, it can be modeled as springs, as harmonic oscillators to pretty good effect. And anharmonic oscillators is an even better way to treat them. But this is a pretty good way to, to model atoms. And therefore, we have the very similar setup. Instead of having a spring constant, we have what's called E, which is our modulus of elasticity, also known as Young's modulus, named after Thomas Young, who was amazing, right? Like, legitimately, we have to say how amazing this guy was. He did contributions in many, many fields. Vision, light, mechanics, energy, physiology, language, musical harmony, and, not to be forgotten, Egyptology, right? 
He worked on the Rosetta Stone. Like, the guy was amazing. Uh, they said about him, he's been described as the last man who knew everything, which I just think is awesome, because I'm all about that Renaissance life, like being good at not just one thing, but many things. I think that's awesome. So brief aside, Thomas Young's awesome. It's worth naming something as awesome as Young's modulus after him, right? He basically said that materials in the elastic regime fit what's called Hooke's Law, right? Now, what do I mean when I say elastic regime? The elastic regime means that when I deform it, I haven't crossed the threshold of permanent deformation. Some materials, if you pull them just a little bit, they'll stretch for sure. Like you can measure the deformation, but if you unload it, it goes right back to how it started. But there exists for many materials, not ceramics, but many other ones, what's called a yield limit, where if you go beyond that, it now starts to permanently deform. So we're talking about the elastic regime. That's recoverable, reversible strain, right? We'll talk about plastic in a moment. Okay, in many cases, the stress versus strain is linear, right? Not always. Yeah, Ashton? Are there ceramics that have zero elasticity? Is that I don't know the answer to that offhand. I'll say that it's so close to zero that it might as well be in, in the vast majority of them. But I mean, they do have some elastic limit, like for sure. It's just going to be very small and incredibly small compared to other classes of materials. Okay? Um, it's oftentimes linear, meaning for a given load, if you double the load in the elastic region, you're going to double the strain, right? That's not always the case. Some really important engineering materials have a nonlinear elastic region. Concrete is a great example. Cement is nonlinear, but it's elastic for a good portion, right? It follows a curve, okay? Many materials, though, can be plotted on a so-called stress versus strain curve. And we're going to do our first clicker question on this. Okay, in the, in the figure that I'm going to show you, right, and for those that might be colorblind, this is um, blue, red, that's green, and this is purple. Okay, the question is, which one would be the ceramic, which one's the polymer, which one's a brittle steel, right? So the first question is, which one is the ceramic? <clears throat> Based on what you know about ceramics, and how happy they are to deform, which one of these would be the ceramic? Okay, got your answers in. Is it blue, red, green, or purple? That's the ceramic. Get your answers in. I should say this is plotting stress on the y-axis, strain on the x-axis. <clears throat> That's the traditional way to plot stress-strain plots. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Okay, closing the poll. Okay, and people think what? Um, blue versus purple. Okay, so blue is the correct answer. The majority got that, but a surprising number of people voted purple. A purple one, think what that represents. For a small load, you're saying that a large strain is produced. Um, what we know about ceramics is that if I take, um, I mean, what's, do I have an example of one? Like a, a sheet of glass, right? Imagine a sheet of glass versus a rubber band. A sheet of glass, I can apply a really big load, and it's still not going to ever visibly stretch. So I'm not going to ever see large strain. It will stretch a little bit, but it takes a, a big load to produce any sort of strain. On the other hand, a rubber band, a kid, a, a five-year-old, can pull these things thousands of times right? in terms of strain. Like a 1,000% strain is easy to achieve in a rubber band. So those are backwards. It's definitely going to be blue as the ceramic. All right? So that probably answers our next question which is which one is the polymer? Blue, red, green, or purple? Can I just say, if you do the reading, these are gimmies too. Like, I think that's kind of an indicator that 30 out of 100 people didn't do the reading in this class, possibly. <laughs> 
Okay, we're going to wrap this one up. Answers in, answers in. Okay, I'm going to close it. Okay, good. <laughs> good. All right, how about this one? Uh, actually, I thought that we were going to do other ones. Which one of these would be a brittle steel versus a tough steel? A brittle steel is one that, that isn't going to deform. So of the two remaining curves, red or green, red would be the brittle steel, whereas green might be a more ductile metal. Okay? And the same material, remember, steels can come in different flavors based on how we process them. We're going to get to that in chapter 11 on kinetics, so we'll come back to that. How can the same material in one case be brittle and the other case be quite ductile? We'll come back to that. Okay? We've mentioned that there are such things as nonlinear elastic deforming materials. Cement, cast iron, a lot of polymers fit this definition. Okay? <clears throat> um, at some point, many materials not all ceramics, but many other materials will start to deform. So the trick is, how do we actually closely define when it starts to deform? Maybe this is your plot. You've got stress versus strain. And I know that the students in my 2010 class, they were testing a bunch of polymers, and the plots typically looked like this. Kind of did like that, right? So it's pretty obvious when it goes from reversible to irreversible. You'd say right at the knee of that curve, but because it's a little bit subjective, like am, I, like am I picking what point here? Am I picking right here where it looks like maybe it's departing from linear? Am I saying it's when it's complete? Is it at the inflection point of that curve? Like, what is it? Because of that, they decided we need a better way to define when plastic deformation begins. And the way that we do it is when there is 0.2% strain if you were to unload it. What do I mean by that? Let's say... At any given point, I unload it. Like up here, I go all the way to this point, and I unload it. It means I take the load off. It's going to do this. Even though I've permanently deformed it, it's still going to recover the elastic portion, right? So the same slope, right? That slope, that is our Young's modulus, E sub Y. It's going to go, it's going to reduce its strain by that much. Even if we're permanently deforming, it's still going to spring back a little bit. So what you do is you do that, and you see where it intersects this x-axis. And the point at which it intersects the x-axis, and it leaves behind 0.2% strain, we give that a name. This stress right there, we call sigma sub y, which is our yield stress. It's the stress at which the material starts to yield, to give, to plastically deform. Okay? Why 0.2%? I have no idea the historical reason for that. But it's just something that everyone decided, okay, at 0.2%, it's permanent deformation. Let's, let's agree that that's the yield stress, right? That's what it is. Any questions on yield stress? Any questions on why it sort of bends back and it doesn't go straight down? Okay, let's keep going. So because that's 0.2%, that's the same as 0.002, right? So it depends on what the x-axis is plotted as. If it's plotted as strain as percent, then you're looking for 0.2. If it's just strain, then 0.002. Okay? Um, so we've said that, like, and you can see it in these materials, these materials all have a constant slope, but the slope is different depending on what material class we're talking about. Ceramics up here have the highest modulus, whereas metals and polymers have a much lower one. Right, much lower modulus. Okay. You could also take the instantaneous slope. At any given point, you could say, "What's my my one?" So they'll call that the secant modulus, right? Um, and we've already tied the deformation, the slope of these things, to the inner inner poten uh, interatomic potentials, right? We said that the interatomic potential, if this is energy versus separation distance. You come down, and then you've got a curve that looks something like that. And this is energy versus R, but we know that the Young's modulus should be proportional to the slope of df dr, right? Evaluated technically times 1 over R0, if I'm being totally correct there, right? So that's the second derivative of energy. Because if you take the derivative of energy, you get force. You take the derivative again, and that should be the Young's modulus. So the derivative is easy, right? The derivative of this point at R0, which is right here, the derivative is just zero. But the second derivative, that's the curvature, right? 
And so it's the second derivative of this plot that we care about. And the, the tighter that curvature is, the higher the modulus. So a ceramic, if you were going to plot this curve, you better draw it with a really sharp curvature compared to a polymer, which would have a really broad curvature. right? Because we know that a polymer has a lower modulus. Ceramic has a higher modulus. Any questions on this? I think it's fascinating that throughout the semester, we will keep coming back to this. And in the very last chapter, electronic properties, we'll still be using this interatomic potential curve because it still teaches us about materials, which is pretty rad. And can I give a, a brief shout out? I went to a talk just this last week by a guy at BYU who's a friend of mine. He came up here to give a physics talk. For the very first time, they, they measured this curve experimentally, which has never been done before. Like That's a, a nature and a science paper, um, measuring this experimentally. So if you want to learn about that, I'll, I'll put the link in the announcements. It's pretty rad that they were able to measure it. Because up till now, we've just said this is how it ought to be, but we had no way of measuring it. And they figured out a way to, which is pretty rad, even for people at BYU. <laughs> Still pretty rad. Okay. So what are some typical values? We know that the modulus of a ceramic is higher than a metal, is higher than a polymer, generally speaking. There's exceptions to this rule. <clears throat> there are ceramics that can be deformed easily. Um, and there's polymers like Kevlar, which is really hard to deform. But in general, that's your, that's your ranking. And these are the typical values that we're talking about. Ceramic is probably on the order of hundreds of gigapascals. If a megapascal is one million pascals, a gigapascal is a billion pascals, right? So met ceramics are hundreds of gigapascals. Metals are between tens and hundreds. And polymers are typically one gigapascal around there, like unity gigapascals, OK? Um, and modulus changes with respect to testing conditions, like temperature. You could imagine if you heat something up, many materials, um, they get less stiff if you heat them up, right? Not all the case. Not always the case, OK? Something that's interesting is that we've been talking about uh, a force applied normal to a material's plane, but shear stress can also give you a proportional response in the shear strain, right? A shear stress tau is going to be proportional to the shear strain gamma, and the constant of proportionality there is what's called the shear modulus. So it's not called Young's modulus anymore. Now it's the shear modulus, okay? If you know the Young's modulus and the shear modulus, you can calculate other properties. We're going to get to that in just a second, okay? There's also something called anelasticity. Anelasticity is fascinating. It means that when you apply the load, you don't see an instantaneous strain. It takes a little while, right? So it makes sense that materials like polymers should have an anelastic response. Because remember, the way that we get deformation in polymers is these long chains sort of slide past each other. So if you apply a load, and those chains have to slide past one another, that might take some time. And so you might see that you apply a load, and five minutes later, it looks like it's stretched a lot more, because it has. There's a time dependence, right? If there is a time dependence that's important on the, the length scale that you care about, then you have an, an, an elastic material. I mean, all things take some time to respond. But if it's longer than you expected, right, for your given application, you have an, an elastic material. And what's rad is that, um, you know, many materials, it's like polymers are the an elastic ones. Everything else isn't. But there's unusual materials. Like, this was a fascinating thing that came up. This is a group of researchers. I think they're at Georgia Tech. They take fire ants, and they test them, because I, why not, I guess, right? And they do mechanical testing of these things, and they'll find that when they load them, it, you don't see the strain of the clump of ants immediately. Instead, it takes a while for them to deform, right? See that, how they dropped it, and now it's like slowly squishing? The reason why that's happening is because these materials, if we talk about them as a material, ants, they have like legs and stuff that they grab onto each other with. And so as you stretch them, you're like, individual legs might break, but not all of them. And so it slowly might deform. This guy, this is who you are if you study fire ants, right? But like, um, they have a pretty rad image. Yeah, so like, here's a function of time. Oh, where is it? No, that's not what I'm looking for. Right, right here. When they apply a load to it, All right, this is not what I was looking for. It's somewhere in here. In any case, I'm not going to spend more time talking about fire ants. I'm just going to say that there are two things to take away from this. First off, you can think of materials in different ways. It's not just polymers, ceramics, and metals. It can be biomaterials, right? It can be species, organism. Uh, there's whole fields in bioengineering where they look at cells, where building blocks of cells are your material, right? Cell membranes, that is your biomaterial, right? Um, and then the second one is that if there's a time response, it's anelastic, okay? 
All right, let's talk about Poisson's ratio. We've talked about this briefly. We said that when you squeeze something, it bulges out the side. When you pull on something, it tends to get skinnier. This has to do with Poisson's ratio. And Poisson's ratio is defined as follows. It's the ratio of the lateral strain to the um, axial strain, right? So if you're pulling on something, that's the axial direction, right, along the axis. And then there's the lateral strain, right? So if you take the ratio of those two strains, you add a negative sign, just by convention, that will give you the Poisson's ratio, okay? And Poisson's ratio is basically everywhere between 0 and, and 0 0.5. Right? Poisson's ratio, oops. They give it by this Greek letter nu, which is like V, but in Greek, right? You've got 0 and 0 0.5. It's going to be somewhere between those two values for everything that I know of. But it's more commonly found to be about one fourth for isotropic materials to maybe one third, right? Typical ranges are between a quarter and a third. Um, but other materials like rubber will have no change at all. It'll be all the way out at zero, at one half, and cork will be at zero, okay? What's cool is that you can use uh, Poisson's ratio to go between ela uh, elastic modulus and shear modulus. There's this really important equation here. Uh, let me just focus on the equation. Where it says that the Young's modulus is equal to two times the shear modulus multiplied by the quantity of one plus your Poisson's ratio. This isn't always true. This is generally true, right? So this is pretty great. The reason why is because measuring Young's modulus is not that bad. You could do a stress versus strain curve and measure Young's modulus pretty easily. Measuring shear modulus can be tricky, right? But here you have an expression where if I give you a stress versus strain curve <clears throat> and I tell you what the dimensions are in real time, you could calculate the Young's modulus, the Poisson's ratio, and then you could calculate the shear modulus, which might be useful for other applications, okay? And there's examples of that on YouTube. Okay. What else can we say? Um, there's other things about the stress-strain curve that are interesting, right? You can have this sort of behavior happen where you're loading it and all of a sudden it sort of like ka-chunk moves down. It does some funny business where it's straining and then it starts to rise again, right? That's a common behavior in metals, right? What's happening is there you have an upper yield point and a lower yield point. So this isn't one where it has like this nice smooth transition that we drew before. And at 0.2%, you know exactly where it yields. Instead, it yields at an upper point. Something happens in the material. Typically, a, a form of fracture of some sort happens. It's going to move down to a lower stress. And then it's going to keep on rising. So here's an interesting question. In this plastic regime, right, this regime out here where it's now permanent deformation, for every bit of additional strain that you want, it costs you more stress. Or in other words, it's getting harder and harder to stretch your material. This is known as work hardening. This is a really important process, right? If you do um, CNC milling, anybody a specialist in CNC milling? Anybody work, you have mechanical engin engineers in here. Any CNC millers? Nobody, not a soul. Oftentimes a problem with CNC milling, if you're f not f familiar with how it works, it's a robot using a drill. That's all CNC milling is, right? The robot moves the drill and passes, and it iteratively like drills down but what can happen is that each time that you drill, you're locally deforming the material right underneath the drill bit. Like it's pulling some material out, but it's deforming other stuff. So as it's deforming it, the drill then comes around again and it's harder, right? And so it, it, it becomes harder and harder to, to cut away your material until you can actually break drill bits and have all these problems due to work hardening during your CNC process, right? So why on earth does that happen? We've really got to wait till next chapter. Next chapter's eight is on deformation mechanisms. For right now, all we're going to say is that Things get harder to deform, and we'll talk about why a little bit later, okay? Another common uh, thing in these plots is to see a maximum value, and then it goes down. And this flies in the face of what I just said. I just said that most materials work harden, right? Most materials, as you continue to form them, it gets harder and harder to deform them. Maybe you've experienced this with a rubber band. Anybody notice, like, when you first start deforming a rubber band, it's really easy, but there comes a point where every little bit that you want it to stretch is harder and harder and harder and harder, right? That's work hardening happening in a, in a polymer, right? So in a metal, why do we sometimes see this behavior, right? So let me ask the question. There's our friend. The question is, does that plot suggest that it's getting harder and stronger up until TS, that's our tensile strength limit, right? Sometimes called the ultimate tensile stress, 
U, T, S, or just T, S. That's the tensile strength or the ultimate tensile strength. It's getting harder and stronger, but then it begins to get weaker. Is that true or is that a false statement? It's getting stronger, meaning work hardening is taking place up until a point, and then it gets weaker because it goes down. Is that a true or false statement? Participation points only on this one. Okay, get your answers in. It's participation points only. So it doesn't matter if you get the right answer, you're going to get all your points. I'm going to close the poll, though, so you do need to click something. <clears throat> I always feel bad. Last two, three people. I don't know. I don't know what to do with you all. So most people think that it is getting harder, and then it gets weaker, right? Three-fourths of us think that it's starting to get weaker. So it's not. It's a trick, right? That's why I made this participation points only. What's actually happening, what's actually happening is something called necking, right? Yet another delightful material science term. You've got your dog bone that looks like this, and you start pulling it, and we know that it's going to fracture in this regime in the middle somewhere, but instead of just breaking all of a sudden, what often happens is necking, where this sort of is your final product where it can be like really elongated, right? So this region, some spot, that might have corresponded to some really narrow section in here. It starts to locally deform. It doesn't deform uniformly anymore. Up until that point, it's been deforming uniformly, but all of a sudden, it will like shrink in on one spot and really start to take off. Like we did this on plastic baggies in the lab. I don't have the picture on me, but it stretched like, they started out like being this tall, and it stretched out to like that far, and it hadn't even broken yet, because one little spot really took off and necked down. So if it necks down, think what's happening. In this necked region, your cross-sectional area is much smaller than the initial cross-sectional area, right? And so therefore, if you were to calculate the stress, which is the force divided by area, and account for this instantaneous area, then your real stress would be much, much higher. It would go up like that. So your material is still work hardening. It's just that we're dividing it by the, the initial cross-sectional area, and that has nothing to do with the area that's deforming anymore, right? That's called necking, okay? Which leads us to a, a, a more thorough discussion on true stress versus true strain. Remember, true stress and true strain, they take into account the instantaneous length change and the instantaneous cross-sectional area, okay? Now, what's interesting is that, I'm going to spare us the math here. You can see it if you want. You can transform from one to the other, right? You can go from the engineering stress to your true stress, right? And these are the expressions that give it. Essentially, what you're doing, the way, the, where that natural log is coming from, right? The true stress is if you were to add up all the individual stresses up to the instantaneous point, sorry, instant, the initial length to the instantaneous length, if you were to iterate over all of those, the integral is dl over l, except that's natural log. That's equal to natural log of li over l naught. So that's where this natural log comes from. Um, I guess all I care about is that you know how to use these expressions, that if you have the stress at any given point, or the strain at any given point, you can calculate the instantaneous or the true stress. Okay? These are only valid up until necking occurs, and then they're not, they don't work anymore. The problem with necking is that instead of being overall this whole region, sort of expanding, you get, that localized, or you get that localized deformation, and the true stress calculation doesn't account for that. Okay? All right. And you can see that, right? So these were initially, say, that, that this distance was like one centimeter. When it, before it broke, that one centimeter really got stretched out because in one spot, it necked in, and it locally deformed quite a bit. And this is very, very common to see is this necking process, Okay? So we've got five more minutes. Let's keep going. Um, there's something called ductility. You're all familiar with the term ductile. A ductile material is one that can be bent. Like a paper clip is, by design, a ductile material so that you can bend it and then it'll close again, right? Um, ductility, we need a way to quantitatively talk about it. The way that we define ductility as engineers is the following. You can do it two ways. 
either percent elongation or percent reduction in area, right? Percent elongation is just as simple as it sounds. You take L final minus L initial divided by L initial, multiply it, turn it into a percent. You can do the exact same thing with area. Take your, uh, that's backwards. That should be final. Oh gosh, let me fix that. Final minus initial divided by initial. That's your reduction in area. Is that wrong? Let me double check that. I'll, I'll double check that. I think that's correct. Right? That's how we quantify ductility in this class. Okay? And from a stress versus strain curve, if I showed you a stress versus strain curve, it would be pretty easy for you to say which one's a ductile material and which one's a brittle material because you can see that in one case, let's say the ductile material, it's able to strain quite a lot. Right? Now, you'll notice that I've written here that the area under the curve is equal to the absorbed energy. Where on earth is energy coming from here, right? That, seems, that feels a bit like a non-sequitur. Like, we've been talking about stress and strain. Where did energy come from on this stress versus strain curve? The way to figure out where it's coming from is to remember the units on this plot. The area under the curve means that you take the two units, right, from the axes, and you multiply them. That's the area under the curve. Well, what are the units of strain? Got no units. What about the units of stress? What are the units there? It's probably in something like megapascals, unless you're doing PSIs because you're a barbarian, right? So pascals, we said that one pascal is equal to a newton per meter squared. That's still not energy, though. How does energy come into this? A newton can be defined in terms of energy. A newton right here is a joule per meter. So we can rewrite this as joules per meter cubed. Or in other words, when you deform the material, the entire region that gets deformed, like whatever part of this bar actually gets deformed, that volume has some meters cubed volume, right, that you could define. So when you, when you deform it, over that entire volume, you're going to generate, it's going to cost some amount of energy to do that deformation. And that's, that's your joules, right? So if you take the area under this curve, that will tell you how much energy went into deforming this material. That's important because this is directly related to the fracture toughness, right? If you remember our Sharpie impact testing, this was a couple chapters ago. But under failure, we talked about Sharpie impact tests, and we said the following. that said it looked like this, right? You start out with your Sharpie tester. It's got a big pendulum with a knife on it, or a hammer, right? You've got your piece that you're going to chop in half. You let this thing swing. As it hits your sample, it's going to absorb some energy, and then it's going to swing up, but it won't go up as high as it would have had you not hit your sample. So we can quantify the amount of energy based off of the height difference. This is crazy that this actually works, right? Like MGH, potential energy, mass times gravity times height. That's going to give you the energy that went into snapping your sample. That should be the same as the energy that goes into the area under this curve, right? So if you have a very tough material, you're going to expect a big area under the curve. A very brittle material won't. That's why ceramics are clear over here. The area under their curve, since they don't strain at all, it, they're, not, they're not very tough. right? The last thing I'll cover today before we're done is that the area under the entire curve is what's called toughness. But we often don't want to deform material, but we still want to know how much energy goes into that. Like springs, for example. We, like if, you're, if you have a car and you want uh, very... Uh, tight springs on it, right? Let's say you have a truck that's going to carry a heavy load. You want to have stiff springs on it. But if you have a, a little Toyota Corolla like me, you don't want to have tight springs because if you go down like a wash road, it's going to feel like you have no springs at all, right? So you want to have, you want, we want to be able to quantify this. You don't want to permanently deform your material, but you want to elastically deform it. That means that you only care about the area under the elastic portion of the curve. We call that the modulus of resilience. And we'll pick up here next time.